Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. This is, uh, I am recording on Friday night, so we get all kinds of disorientation during these times. I'm glad that uh, we have this opportunity to be able to continue to worship the Lord and to lift up his name. We are going to be looking again in Acts chapter 15 this week, uh, continuing on where we left off a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we enjoyed a good service last week. It was quite a bit of ch uh, different things uh, had to be done in order to make it work. Uh, felt like uh, it was worth it for one Sunday, for Easter Sunday. I'm hoping that soon we will be able to see some restrictions lifted. I don't know when we will be allowed to meet again, but it sounds like the province is now inching towards remo or, uh, perhaps lifting some restrictions in a few weeks, maybe three or four weeks. So let's just hope and pray that the Lord will open up uh, the opportunity for us to meet again very soon. I very much miss meeting with you. I've talked to a few on the phone. It's been a blessing to hear your voice, and it was good to see several of you on Sunday, and uh, a blessing, I think, for all of us. Well, what we want to do to start off with is to uh, make a few announcements and uh, share prayer requests. And uh, by way of announcement, uh, we, are, we certainly do encourage you to continue to be thinking of those who are not able to, we can't even visit them, uh, those who are in the homes. We think of uh, Paulette and Dirk and Vera in that regard, and as well Nora in her own home, but uh, still unable to really go and visit her as well. So be in prayer for them and make contact with them if you can make a phone call for uh, in some cases, or drop a card or something, I think that would be a great blessing to them. And I would encourage you to call to one another every so often, just to hear the other voice and to uh, rejoice uh, together uh, with one another. I do get to see some of you on Facebook. Not that that's really seeing you, but it's something. And uh, we're glad to, uh, glad to ha see what's going on in your lives and uh, with, with all of you, and good to talk to some of you all as well this week. Now on Wednesday, we will be continuing in 1 John. We started this section uh, that starts off, Love One Another, and the first portion of that is, Love One Another, God is Love. That's what we, we talked about uh, last Wednesday. This Wednesday will be, Love One Another, This is Love. And we're going to talk about the ultimate manifestation of real love. That's what next Wednesday, or that's the plan for Wednesday's message in any case. We also have a birthday this week. Now we did celebrate all the birthdays for April last uh, Sunday, but the, the one that is upcoming is uh, young Mr. Schmitz, Christian Schmitz, and we're so glad uh, for him and uh, we enjoy his fellowship and I look forward to being able to be in a service with him, with him playing the piano again, as well as our other pianists. But happy birthday to Christian this week. Now on prayer requests, we do want to continue to be praying for the Alder Leaston and uh, Newfield families. Pray for uh, Vera's son, Stuart, who is uh, recovering from quadruple bypass surgery in Kelowna. Certainly that's serious. I think I heard something about him going home. Now, I, see, I... I, I these things, I talked to my wife about them, and uh, she didn't, we didn't talk about this specifically today. I, we talked about it some, a couple days ago, uh, and I have a vague memory, and don't remember exactly what was said, but do pray, continue to pray for him and for their family. There's, there's, there's needs there in other ways. Pray also for Marlene's son, Dennis, who is uh, recovering from a, a recent stroke. And that was a shock to his family as well. So do pray for them and that that would be, uh, the Lord would use that. Pray for our missionaries. And we'll be praying for all of them by name in just a moment. And then, of course, the job situations that we are concerned about for, for Rob and for um, Richard and for Wolf, especially in, uh, in trying times with their work. And then others, you know, uh, I, I, I say, it seems like I say this all the time. If, if you would like... Uh, me to be praying for your situation in particular, please let us know uh, and uh, be very much um, glad to uh, 
add you to the list and specifically pray for you on my own. But I, uh, and, and then, of course, uh, we have several working in the hospital. So pray for Maureen and pray for uh, 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 Richard, Carrie, and then for uh, Zoli as well. And also, uh, I, I want to add a personal request is uh, for my mom. And she is, uh, just the last couple days, she's been having some problems with uh, falling. And she's 96. And so do in, be in prayer for her. And uh, we are, she's, uh, she's a very independent person. I don't, I don't know where she got that from. It wasn't from me, so <laughs> maybe I got it from her. But she is, uh, she, is, she is pretty feisty about where she wants to be and what she wants to do. But her, uh, she is aging, of course, and, and there are effects. So do pray, be in prayer for wisdom and for just the Lord would take care of her. All right, well, we will go to prayer now, and we'll be mentioning these things, and, uh, and let's join together uh, praying for one another. Dear Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we have to bring our requests before you. We first of all want to praise you for the salvation that you have given us, for the life that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for all the blessings you heap on us every day, even in spite of the troubles we're in, we do know that we have so much from you each day, and we do are grateful to you for what you have done for us. Lord, we do have these things on our hearts. We think of those of our congregation who are shut in and in, uh, in their homes or in the, in the uh, care homes, and nobody's able to visit them. And It's a very lonely time for them. Lord, we do pray that you would just comfort them and that you would enable us to still minister to them in one way or another. We pray for uh, uh, Paulette, for Dirk, for Nora, for Vera. We also pray for Joanne up in her home in Mill Bay. It's a challenge for her as well to get about. Lord, we pray for um, uh, the Alderlistons and the Newfield families with their losses recently. We do lift them up before you and ask your blessing on them. We pray for Stuart. Uh, Vera's son. We pray that you would help as he recovers. And Lord, we pray that you would speak to his heart as well. And then for Marlene's son, Dennis, we ask the same as he recovers from his stroke. And we pray that you would work in his life and the extended family. There's so many of them that really do need a, to know you personally. And we pray, the Lord, that you would uh, open eyes during this very difficult time. We pray for uh, the, uh, the, the virus situation that we are all experiencing. We do hear signs or at least news or perhapses and possibilities of things uh, uh, changing and getting back to normal, whatever that is. But Lord, we do pray that you would give wisdom to those who are leading us and help them to, uh, to make decisions that are, uh, are in light of the actual uh, situation on the ground. Lord, there's been so much fear and so much, uh, all kinds of propaganda from either side of the issue. Lord, we pray that you will help them to navigate those difficult waters and make wise decisions for us going forward. Lord, we pray for our missionaries. We lift them each one up to you. For the Comptons in Alaska, we pray that you will bless them in their situation up there in Selowick. We pray for the Hammermeisters in Surrey and that you will work in their congregation and uh, with all the struggles that each one of us are facing. We pray for the Holloways in Saskatchewan and for the uh, Fossets uh, in Quebec. We pray for the Petersons, Aaron Peterson and Tim Peterson and their families in Germany. We pray for, the, uh, for Brother Gamparev in Mongolia and the believers there in, in Ulaanbaatar. We pray that you would work in that uh, city and that your name would be glorified and souls would be saved. And we pray for uh, the work in Myanmar and we also pray for the Wagners who are now on furlough in the States. And we do pray that you would open doors for them and that uh, in spite of all the troubles that you will uh, refresh them and bring them back to their field in a good time and that they might be able to continue to serve you. We pray for your blessing now 
as uh, uh, we go on with our service, we pray that your name would be glorified in what we are doing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, as I said, we're in Acts chapter 15. And we're going to be uh, carrying on from where we left off last time. When we were here last time, we had finished our look at uh, the speech of James, uh, the elder, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He, was, uh, he is the Lord's brother. Uh, he doesn't make much of that. He, in fact, uh, uh, doesn't even mention it. But tradition tells us that's who he was. And uh, our passage today is uh, the letter that the council wrote and sent to the church in Antioch. Uh, this letter is really a founding document of the New Testament church, in a sense. And uh, I was, as I was studying this, I, it sort of struck me as I thought about it. Here is, this is a copy. What we have in the book of Acts is a copy of the actual letter that was sent. And uh, so it's a document. It became a part of the archives of the church, in a sense. That, was, that it became a part of scripture, ultimately. At this time in history, there's only a few New Testament books written, if, if any. Uh, pr I'm pretty sure the epistle of James has been written. Uh, that is generally considered the first New Testament book, and it's usually considered to be a, a written, I think, around A.D. 45. And this council is A.D. 49. And then, uh, I believe, the Gospel of Matthew has also been written fairly near the same time as the letter of James within a year or two. And then, uh, as we've taught in this uh, series, the book of Galatians, the letter to the Galatians, uh, was written. And it was uh, written in, in the midst of this very crisis. Now, it wouldn't have been widely circulated at this point, but it had gone out to the churches of Galatia, who then saved it, and eventually it would have been disseminated amongst the churches uh, as, as the uh, work of God uh, expanded through the Roman Empire. Now, uh, there are uh, the last two on my list, Matthew and Galatians, are, are somewhat controversial. Galatians, because some think Galatians was written a bit later. Uh, we won't go into all of that now. I think it was written earlier, right in conjunction with this, perhaps right before this very council had been had taken place. But when I say, I talked about this letter that we have here in Acts chapter 5 as being a founding document. And so with those writings, it becomes a part of the body of, of written material that the church is going to uh, treasure and hold until it becomes, eventually becomes a part of the, of the book of Acts, which isn't going to be writ written for another probably 10 years. So we've got 10 years worth of ministry uh, that is going to take place before the book of Acts is written. Now, Matthew is controversial as being written at this time because many people think it was written later. Uh, very few commentators would agree with me on my placing of Matthew at the point at which I, I place him. But uh, here's my reasons. First of all, Matthew focused on presenting Jesus as the rightful Jewish Messiah. Now, all agree on this point. Matthew was writing to Jews. Everyone agrees about that point. Now, it makes sense to me. Uh, well, before I get to that, the, uh, the second point I want to make is that the impulse to create written records would have been an early idea in the church. Uh, there were, in fact... Uh, 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 we have this letter that we have here in this chapter, and no doubt there were other writings. Uh, Luke mentions in Luke 1.1 uh, that many wrote things down. I was going to say that a little bit later in the message, but it's appropriate here. So there were, uh, there were people writing down uh, the, the things that the apostles were teaching. They were taking notes on the sermons, if you will. And, uh, and there became a sense or a body of teaching that became sort of the orthodox teaching of the church. And that's what formed eventually or became to be collected in the Synoptic Gospels. And uh, it makes sense because the church at this time is primarily Jewish. 
it makes sense that Matthew, who's writing to Jews, would write his Jewish gospel at that time. That's why I, um, that's why, that, that is to me the major reason, it's a logical reason. There's no evidence that's, that internal or external that gives a date to any of these gospels. It's, it's a matter of thinking through uh, pretty much the, some of the details. It, certainly they had to be a, written before the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, surely they would have mentioned that uh, or in some way, but they all mentioned Jerusalem as existing as they write these gospels. And so, uh, uh, the, the, um, so they had to be written before 70 AD, but when exactly, we don't know. Now, as the church expanded into the Greek world, there would be a need for a Greek gospel. And that's, we all agree, all the writers agree, that Luke's gospel is a Greek gospel. And so it makes sense for it to come later. I believe it came right about the same time as the book of Acts. And most commentators agree that Luke was written, uh, conservative commentators agree that Luke was written about the time of Paul's imprisonment in, uh, in Caesarea, 57 to 59, and then Acts would follow shortly after. And then, uh, and then finally, as the church and some apostles reach Rome, there is now a, a Latin dimension to the, uh, to the church and um, uh, a new voice is thought to be useful and that's where Mark comes in. Many commentators will agree, or most of them agree, that Mark has a Roman point of view and appeals to the Roman sensibilities. And so, to me, those historical factors, the expansion of the church, uh, give the best reason for the order of, in which the, the Gospels were written. But as I'm saying, at this point, there are certain founding documents. So we have uh, James, we have Matthew, we have this letter. It's, it's a document that's going to be preserved to be used later by Luke. And uh, uh, so I... Uh, I believe that uh, whether, or uh, I put in my notes, whether Matthew or and Galatians exist at this point or not, there were likely scraps of accounts in circulation that form the body of knowledge on which the church begins to define itself. All right. So Luke, as I said, mentions many who wrote things down in Luke one one, and then Luke incorporates this letter into the book of Acts. Uh, so that means. This happens in AD 49. That means in about, about 10 years later, uh, there is a copy of that letter available to, to Luke to include with this material. Now, uh, Luke's use of this letter emphasizes its importance. In other words, he, he's not just looking for filler material. He's including it because he thinks it's important to the story. Uh, the content of the letter talks about essentials. And um, uh, the letter, uh, 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 the, and those essentials are the four burdens that James mentioned in his speech. He says, let us not burden the Gentiles any further than these four things. All right, so they're going to make some recommendations. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And... Uh, he is going to mention those four things again in Acts 21-25. Now, those things are, I think, uh, as I think about it, and as I said it again this week for this uh, particular message, I believe that there is uh, more that needs to be said about those things. I think I need to expand on that some more. So we're going to come back to those four things here in the letter. We'll talk about Acts 21-25. And we're going to talk about the impact and the meaning these things have for the church and for the Christian life. What, what, is it, what is James trying to communicate? And what is the New Testament trying to communicate to us about how we should live? I mean, there is something that we're, it is teaching us about salvation, but then these things have to do with after salvation, how we should live. And so we want to talk about uh, those things. Again, I'll expand on that next week, Lord willing. Well, uh, but I want you to notice. So we have the... James' speech, he mentions the four things. We have the letter, he mentions the four things. We have James mentioning it again several years later, Acts 20, uh, 21. 
he mentions those four things again. All of those mentions underscore the importance of this message that James and the apostles have established as a foundational idea within the church. He calls them, in the letter, it calls them essentials. So that's important. We're going to talk, I guess I say, more about this. Now, as we look through this letter, we're going to find that the letter contains a careful but firm affirmation of Paul's side in this big argument that uh, began this chapter. The argument with the Judaizers over whether or not circumcision was to be required or other matters of the law, as Paul mentions in Galatians. There's a few things he mentions there, keeping a feast and so on, that might, would, might, could possibly also be included in this category. So uh, Paul, is, uh, uh, Paul has made his case. He argued vigorously for it in the first part of the chapter. Then this big council, big powwow in Jerusalem was called. And now they've come to a conclusion. And, the, um, uh, and, and what the church has done is they have come down very carefully, but very firmly on Paul's side. And we're going to see that as we look at the letter uh, here today. And I want to say this as well, that this affirmation becomes extremely important for the essential gospel message. And we'll show you that in the proposition in just a moment. But first what I want to do is read the passage that includes the letter. We're going to begin in verse 22 of Acts 15, and we're going to go through to verse 29, which is the end of the letter. Verse 22 is the preamble, if you will. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they sent this letter by them. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with their words unsettling your souls, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. Now, that's the letter. and We'll talk about the form of the letter in just a moment. But I want to give you the proposition at this point. And here it is. The, the repudiation of Judaizing firmly supports the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Okay, I'll read that again. The repudiation of Judaizing firmly supports the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. All right, that's our proposition. I want to emphasize here, note the term. I'm saying Judaizing here, not Judaism. Now, there is something, we'll talk about this a little bit later. There is something that is going to happen about Judaism, but it's not Judaism so much that the apostles have a beef with. It is Judaizers. Those who want to impose the Jewish law on Christianity as a requirement for salvation. Those are the Judaizers. All right. Well, we have three points. I do not have, I do not succeed in alliteration. I sort of thought about it. <laughs> Two of my points have alliteration, and one does not. And so we don't have alliteration. But that's the way it is. So my first point is this. Unanimous support of faith alone and repudiation of faith plus. That's sort of a minor point in this first point. But unanimous support of faith alone. This is the big point, really, of, of today's message. Uh, the other two points are going to be shorter. So uh, when you hear me going to point two, you'll know we're closing in on the end. All right, point one. So this decision that is made, they, it seemed good to the apostles 
and the elders. They, they made a decision. So after James has spoken, the council responds with what I'm going to call unanimous consent in favor of James's solution. So you notice who we have here in verse 22. It seemed good to the apostles. All right, so Peter, John, Andrew, you know, whoever is in that group who happened to be in Jerusalem for this meeting. Paul certainly is a part of this. But uh, the, uh, uh, so those are the men who are especially appointed by God as the, 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 the founding leaders of the church. The apostles and the elders. So that includes James, who is an elder in the church in Jerusalem. He is the elder of the church in Jerusalem. There are perhaps others who are serving with him on the pastoral staff, if you want to use that term. And then there's likely other pastors, elders, from churches in surrounding communities that have come to this meeting as well. And then notice this, with the whole church. With the whole church. And so it appears then that this is a unanimous decision. Those who tended to support Judaizing, uh, or, or tended to be sympathetic to the Judaizers, uh, are either won over or they left. And they, they said, we're, we're not, we don't have any part of this anymore. And they stomped out. That could have happened. We don't know. It doesn't say. But it says here that the whole church has come to this decision. So the decision is the decision of the whole church. And as, uh, as the text emphasizes here, the apostles, the elders, and the whole church. All right? So that's a big statement. There, these are the ones who are behind this decision. And then in the communication of the decision, obviously Paul and Barnabas are going to return to Antioch. They came to Jerusalem from their ministry in Antioch because they were concerned and they wanted an answer and they wanted uh, the other apostles to uh, join with them in the, in the truth of the gospel. And so, uh, so they were going to be returning. But it wouldn't be enough for ju to just send them with the decision because they want to really underscore how strongly they are supporting this decision. So they decide that they're going to send an official delegation to accompany them. And we're going to have just a brief moment here. We'll talk about these two men. First of all is Judas, called Barsabas. Now, we don't know anything else about him. This is the only place in the New Testament where he is mentioned at all. But uh, there is an interesting side note. In Acts chapter 1, you will remember that the Judas Iscariot had died, uh, had committed suicide, and had betrayed the Lord, and of course, who is no longer a member of the number. And so the, the apostles, under the leadership of Peter, decided that they needed to add to the number, and I think they were right. And you will remember, I think, that Matthias, Matthias was the one who was selected. Well, there were two men who were uh, up for nomination to be one of the apostles. The other one was a man named Joseph called Barsabas. The exact same surname. Uh, so, of course, that leads to speculation. Commentaries cannot notice that uh, similarity without speculating. And the speculation is that these two men are brothers. We have no way of knowing. But we do know that they were leading men. It says... Uh, uh, to uh, Judas called Barsabbas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So there are leading men in this church, both Judas and Silas. They're men of note. So if Joseph called Barsabbas was to be considered even perhaps as, a, as an apostle, he's certainly a leading man. And if they're related, then it stands to reason there's, there's a trait in here of a family that's following the Lord and living for the Lord. So, um, so then we want to talk about Silas. Silas uh, is also, uh, of course, you know that he's going to become the, uh, the uh, companion of Paul on his second missionary journey. And uh, he is also uh, mentioned in several epistles as being with Paul when Paul writes. But usually under the term Silvanus, Silvanus. Uh, uh, that Silas is a short form of Silvanus, which is a Latin name. And there's a passage in there where Paul uh, speaks about, or he's in prison in Philippi, 
and he speaks about his, um, uh, or, he, or he, he challenges the, uh, the officials, and he says, men who are Roman citizens. And so uh, there is some thought that Silas, like Paul, was also a Roman citizen. It's not absolutely clear to me that that is the case, but in any case, it could very well be. Uh, and here they are. Uh, that's who he is. And he, we're going to see him numerous times in Acts. And this is one of Luke's things. Here he is. So Silas is introduced, and then he's going to become a larger figure later on. That's just the way it happens in the book of Acts. Anyway, this is the thing. But one of the commentators made an interesting point about this delegation being sent uh, with Paul and Barnabas to Antioch. And he said, put it this way, this is Homer Kent, he said, this would alleviate any possible criticism that the results of the council were unfairly reported by Paul. So Paul goes back to Antioch and he is, uh, you know, saying, well, here's what the council decided. Well, okay, that's fine, but there could be Judaizers who would criticize you know, Paul just made up his own story about what the council decided. So the council, in their wisdom, through the leadership of the Holy Spirit, sent these two men as official representatives of the church with a specific message to announce. And they sent, of course, a letter with them that would, that would uh, corroborate the message. So they did everything they could to make certain that their official position was known and there, nobody could gainsay it. So this is part of that unanimous consent. This is part of the support that the, that the council is making for Paul's position. They really want to lay this, nail it down because they're very interested in teaching salvation by faith alone. So that's a big thing for them. And then there's a couple of other things we notice in the letter itself that uh, lend support to this universal decision. So in uh, the introduction to the letter, I want to say a couple things about the letter itself. The letter is written in a very formal style. It's in the Gentile style of writing letters. Uh, and you can find all kinds of documents in the Old, Te or in the Old Testament, in the, in the <laughs> garbage dumps of the, of the uh, Roman Empire, where there are letters with exactly the same format. It's just the way Gentiles wrote letters. Now, and one commentator suggests that this Jewish congregation is, is doing everything it can to communicate their support for the Gentile brothers. And so they even write their letter the way the Gentiles would write the letter. I thought that was an interesting observation. Now, uh, the, it names the leading officials in Jerusalem, the apostles and brethren who are the elders. Look at verse 23. They sent this letter, the apostles and the brethren who are elders. Notice that title. That's the, that's the one sending it. To the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Now, notice those, that use of the term brethren in both categories. What they are saying is that they are on an equal footing. We are brothers, you are brothers. You are our brothers. The NIV uh, is uh, more of an interpretive translation than I actually care for, although it does have some interesting ways of putting things. And in this verse, it puts it this way. The apostles and elders, your brothers. Your brothers to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Uh, that really gets it across, doesn't it? What they are saying is, we are in this together, and we believe the same things. So the unanimous, the unanimous support of faith alone, this is really important. And then there's a re reference to the unanimous decision. Uh, he's, they say, let's see, verse 25, it seemed good to us having become of one mind. This is one thing that does make me think that the congregation, that those who were sympathetic or leaning towards the Judaizing side had been won over by the discussion, have become of one mind, it says. And so, uh, so they really, that in itself lends support to this unanimous, unanimous position of the church in Jerusalem. And then there's one more thing. 
Oh, they should, yeah, one more thing, lending support here. And that is in verse 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Isn't that interesting? So the authority for this letter. The authority for this letter is the Holy Spirit himself. That's really important. The Holy Spirit. The first mention of the Holy Spirit in the whole chapter. Now, these leaders had, re, uh, uh, had been discussing. They didn't have direct, they had no direct communication from the Holy Spirit on this. And yet they are confident that, the Holy, that the, they have the Spirit. And they do so, I believe, because they are men who relied on and were conscious of the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I think that as the Holy Spirit brought this group into a unanimous position, they recognized this is the work of God. The decision we're coming to is the decision of the Holy Spirit. And they were right, of course. And then it says, and to us, sort of as an add-on. You know, the Holy Spirit decided, and we're in it too. We're in it too. But this, their unanimity here is a manifestation of the Spirit's activity. That's the point that we're making with this. Their unanimity is a fruit of the long history of the Spirit's leading on this topic. Way back, years before, Peter and Cornelius. That is the Holy Spirit leading. We, uh, Antioch and Barnabas, as he went up there, and the Lord began to work, and souls began to be saved, and the church began to grow. He goes and finds Paul to help him. All of that history, that's part of this story. And then Paul and the, uh, and the churches of Galatia. I mean, the Holy Spirit's working. We can't deny it. And so the, so the apostles say, look, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, and we come to this conclusion. So all of these things support the unanimous support of faith alone and, I said, and a repudiation of faith plus. And that's the last thing I want you to notice. Look at verse 24. Since we have heard that some of our number, to whom we gave no instruction, have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls. Now, they acknowledge that the men of Acts 15, verse 1, were of our number. They were, they had been part of that church in Jerusalem. Maybe they'd repented by now, after all this meeting, and they saw where they had gone wrong, and maybe they repented, and maybe they voted right along. Maybe they're part of the unanimous consent. But in Acts 15, 1, uh, it said, Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, they are saying, yes, they, they, they were from us. But, okay, there's a but, and they repudiate their message, and they use very strong language. They said, they, these men uh, disturbed you with their words. They unsettled your souls. Now, I, I could just give you the brief of this, but I, I want to read to you a little bit from, uh, from A.T. Robertson and his, uh, uh, he gives a little bit of light on this in his word pictures of the New Testament. And so having troubled you with their words, he says, what a picture of turmoil in the church in Antioch. Words, words, words. This verb, tarasso, means to agitate, to make the heart palpitate. He refers to John 14, verse 1. Uh, let your not, uh, not your hearts be troubled, and so forth. And, and, an, in, and, uh, and an instrumental case of logos, of, or of words. In other words, the words are what caused all these palpitations, all this agitation. And then the other word, he's, uh, he says, uh, where it says, um, troubling your souls, or unsettling your souls. This is an old verb, which means to pack up baggage, to plunder, to ravage. And so it's a powerful picture, Robertson says, of the havoc wrought by the Judaizers among the simple-minded Greek Christians in Antioch. Now, I'm not sure how simple-minded they were, but they were troubled. They, it was like somebody had come in and had raided their hearts and stolen their, their goods and had... And had, uh, and had uh, um, uh, looted their spiritual city, taking away their doctrine of salvation by faith alone. That is how troubling this was to them. And they're making it certain that these folks know. They're making certain, first of all, that the, this message from these men, though they were from our church, 
was not authorized. It was not authorized. Robertson goes on to say, this is a flat disclaimer of the whole conduct of the Judaizers in Antioch and in Jerusalem, a complete repudiation of their effort to impose the Mosaic ceremonial law upon the Gentile Christians. That's strong language, and he means to say it. He really does. Uh, that's, I think that's what this, they're saying. They're, they're, look, we are all behind the doctrine of salvation by faith alone, and we are repudiating those who made uh, claims otherwise. They're very clear about this. All right? So they've really, really laid down their agreement with the Apostle Paul. Now, this brings us to point two. Remember, I said these were the shorter ones. Point two, a ringing endorsement of the Apostle of Faith Alone. Who's that? Well, of course, we know that the Apostle of Faith Alone uh, is Paul. Now, of course, they all believed in faith alone, but he is so connected with the doctrine of salvation in writing Romans and in his great missionary journeys and all of the uh, Galatians, in fact, as well, and all of his consistent, constant message of salvation by faith alone, that's Paul. So a ringing endorsement of the apostle of faith alone, verses 25 and 26, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Saul, or Paul. Sorry, Barnabas and Paul. Our beloved, notice that term, our beloved. This is their relationship to these leaders. There is, some commentators like to say there's a rift, there's a division, there's a jealousy between Peter and Paul, or between Peter or Paul and Jerusalem. It's not so. They love one another. Paul is their beloved brother. Peter's going to use that same term when he talks about him in his epistle, uh, 2 Peter. These men love one another, and they have a special relationship. So a ringing endorsement of Paul in that sense, but not only that, on his reputation, the next verse, it says, men who have risked their lives for the, for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So these are men who are willing to deliver over. Now that's a word that, that normally means to betray. So, so in a sense, they betrayed their own lives, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, their lives didn't matter. They were, they, they were interested in serving the Lord. They were willing. It's not that they were willing to die. It's just that they, they just gave it all over. They're serving the Lord. That is the thing that they did. And that was their reputation. Ought to be our reputation. You know, really. Uh, we can get very wrapped up in our things right now. Uh, I think about uh, my own things that I dearly love. I love all my things. In fact, I can't throw any of my things away. My wife will tell you there's stuff in our attic that she would like to throw away, but no, we can't do that. That's a flaw. I know that's a flaw. Uh, and um, and we're very attached to those things. And it's not just trivial things like that. There's, there's even all the stuff in my house. You know, the stuff that we're actually using right now, I kind of like it. But uh, suppose, let's just suppose, that this, dev this virus situation was so devastating that, that I and everybody else here went bankrupt. Would you keep on serving the Lord? Boy. These men were willing to risk to give up their whole lives for the Lord. And that's where we ought to be. That's where we ought to be. But anyway, I'll get away from meddling here. <laughs> A ringing endorsement of the apostle of faith alone. These men, and this is the point, these men, the Jerusalem leaders, put themselves firmly in the camp of the apostle of faith alone, they were on Paul's side. They were not at all giving any room to the Judaizers. They weren't going, oh, well, you know, these Judaizers are good men. They do have some good points. They were not saying that. They were saying these men went out. They were from our church, but they, did, they had no authorization to say what they said. And we are sending along Saul and uh, 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 Judas and, and Silas in order... Uh, with our beloved brother Barnabas and Saul, Paul, 
who are men who have risked their lives for the gospel's sake, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, to give you this message. It's so important. They were, they were, not, they were firmly behind a ringing endorsement of the apostle of faith alone. That was point two. See how quick that one was? Now we're on point three. Point three is the repetitive emphasis of the message of faith alone. Now, this whole conclusion of the matter does stamp the Jerusalem position as salvation by faith alone. It's the general drift of the council's deliberations. There was some initial discussion. There was some back and forth to start with. But then Peter gets up. And remember, I, I observed some weeks ago that the that Luke is only recording those who were in support of Paul's position. He doesn't record the arguments of those who are against. So he records, he records Peter's statement. All right? And Peter is, of course, in support of Paul. And then Paul and Barnabas speak, and we already know what happened. They're, he doesn't need to give us those details. That's Acts 13 and 14. And they tell about what God is doing amongst the Gentiles. And then James get, gets up to speak. And as we've seen, James also supports uh, Paul's position. All of this leads to making the same point over and over and over again. Salvation is by faith alone for Gentiles as well as for Jews, or rather for Jews as well as for Gentiles. Remember the P- Peter's position, we are saved the same way they are. Uh, Jews have to be saved the Gentile way. That's, that's really what his message was. So powerful. That's an amazing statement. And so this letter now is the formal statement of their conclusion. The, uh, and the letter supports faith alone. And the letter itself repeats several things already stated in the text. Now in verse 22, it says, it reveals to us, the apostles and elders came to a decision. And then look at verse 23. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the, those who are in, uh, brethren in Antioch, and we are telling you that we've come to a decision. So it's said once, apostles and elders came to a decision. Now in the letter, we have the same information. The apostles and elders came to a decision. Okay, And then the council appoints Judas and Silas. That's mentioned in verse 22. And then it's mentioned again in the letter. All right, down in verse 25. We've appointed... Uh, Uh, Let's see, where is it? Sorry, verse 27. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas. All right? And so uh, so uh, we have that repetition. And then the body of the letter, which we aren't getting into today. But verse 28 and 29, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit that we only lay these essentials on you, abstain from food sacrificed to idols and so forth, and, and all that. All right, so that was earlier stated in verse... Uh, 20, uh, let's see, verse 20, verse 20, by James, when he recommends, here, we're not going to trouble the Gentiles any longer, but let's just say this to them, that they refrain from idolatry, from uh, fornication, from etc., etc., all those four things, all right? So we have a repetition. And I mentioned earlier that, again, those four things are mentioned in Acts 21, verse 25. So... (coughs) The point, though, here, this whole letter, the body of this letter, why did Luke put it into this part of the Bible? He didn't have to. He had already announced the decision. James had already announced the decision. He could have just simply said, all right, they they came to a decision. Everybody agreed. They appointed Judas and Silas as uh, witnesses uh, or as as, as, uh, representatives to go and take the message to the people in Antioch and and they sent a letter along authorizing them. He could have said, that's all he could, he didn't have to include the letter. So why did he include the letter? To emphasize the position. And when we, in the scriptures, when we have rep- repetition like this, we should pay attention. God is emphasizing the position. This is God's position. This is God's position. And it emphas- this is the way they bold the points. All right? Uh, <clears throat> here's the message. We hold to salvation by faith alone. No work of man involved ever. That's what they believe. That's what they're holding to. That's what they're supporting with this letter. That's why they're sending these men. And they repeat it. It's repeated several times in the text to emphasize this is the position of the church. 
All right? And so our proposition, the repudiation of Judaizing firmly supports the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Now, I want to emphasize again, we are talking about repudiating Judaizing, not Judaism. Now, Christianity replaced Judaism uh, uh, in this dispensation, but it didn't repudiate it as being false. It was true for its time. It was God's way of dealing with mankind for its time. But then in this new dispensation, in the New Testament era, God is dealing with people in a different way. And that is through the church. And this is the church's statement. All right? We repudiate any attempt to add to the doctrine of salvation by faith alone any kind of human work. That's what we're doing. Uh, and we do uh, continue to repudiate Judaizing. As we go through church history, we find many, many churches and Christians, uh, professing Christians, through the years have had the temptation to add to the gospel some kind of work. Oh, you need to be baptized in order to be saved. Many churches teach that. All right? That's Judaizing. Okay. The Roman church teaches that. Church of Christ teaches that. Some Baptists teach that. You need to be baptized in order to be saved. That's Judaizing. You're adding something to the gospel. All right? And uh, um, there's a tendency to turn the gospel of faith alone into a message of salvation by works. Any message of salvation by works is no New Testament message. It twists the gospel and leaves men in darkness. You cannot be saved by your own efforts. You can only be saved. You can only have a right relationship with God by calling out to God on the basis of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross to ask him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you and to make you righteous in him. That's the only way you can be saved. He has done it all. You have done nothing. You just simply call, whosoever shall call, shall be saved. By the way, calling isn't a work. It's desperation. It's reaching up with a hand, hoping somebody is up there to grab it. <laughs> yeah, but of course, you know who's there to grab it. All right? It is not a work, but it is the desperation, the desperate faith of the dying man who realizes he cannot save himself. The only way to come to God is by faith in Jesus Christ who died for your sins. I hope that's true of you. And I hope as we've considered this, you will see that in this letter, the Jerusalem church and the apostles and the elders and the whole church are affirming this doctrine and it became a founding principle, a founding doctrine, a founding uh, document even of the Christian church that we all rest our faith in, in what the Lord Jesus uh, led these men to teach us. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this time as we've considered this passage and what it means. And Lord, I pray that you would consider, continue to work in our hearts and lives as we uh, live by this faith and as we uh, seek to, to proclaim this faith in our community. Lord, we pray that in these desperate times we might be able to have creative ways that we can announce to people about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and perhaps there would be some who would be willing to listen even at this time. We pray that you'd open up hearts and minds. We pray that you would stir up hearts. If there's anybody listening who does not know you as a personal Savior, that they would turn from their sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you. We will uh, see you again, uh, virtually speaking, on Wednesday evening.